morning, everybody. It is wonderful to see everybody and um, get this program started. So let me advance the slide. There we go. Welcome. So my name is Donna Llewellyn. I'm the executive director of the Boise State Institute for Inclusive and Transformative Scholarship, IFITS. And I'd like to say IFITS, you fits, we all fits. And IFITS is the home of the Office of Undergraduate Research. And we are so really excited to help facilitate today's undergraduate research showcase. I have the honor of co-chairing the planning committee with my colleague, Michal Temkin Martinez. And our whole committee welcomes you to this morning's plenary presentation of lightning talks given by our undergraduate students. So first, I want to invite all of our listeners um, to listen with grace and generosity of spirit. It has been an incredibly long two years of Zoom meetings. And I think that therefore you can all understand that at some point technology will not work the way that we want it to. Our students are zooming in from all over either campus or home or wherever they could find a quiet spot. Um, and so sound might get glitchy and that, that's okay. We are super proud of our students. Um, we are recording this session. And so it will be posted in a bit on our Office of Undergraduate Research website. Um, before I get completely started, I want to val um, honor the Boise Valley people. The original inhabitants are from the Burns Paiute, Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Fort McDermott Paiute, the Shoshone Paiute, and the Shoshone Bannock. It is upon their traditional and customary lands that some of us reside and call home, and upon which our campus stands. Also, as a reminder, there are feedback forms on the event Google site, and we'll have links posted throughout in chat and in our slide deck. Um, we really welcome your feedback. And undergrads, that is your ticket to win some really cool prizes, including an iPad. So you have to be present at the closing session at three o'clock in order to be eligible, and you have to have completed one of those um, feedback forms. I need to express my gratitude to the organizing committee and to the team at IFITS for all of the hard work that they've put in and getting ready for today. I also wanna thank all of our students. The lightning talk presenters who you're about to hear from, the poster presenters who you'll hear from this afternoon. It's been a hard year. I keep on hearing the word tired whenever I talk to people. Um, and yet students, you persevered. You learn new ways of connecting with mentors and new ways of being a scholar. And my last thanks and heartfelt gratitude goes to all the staff and faculty who have supported our students, whether as research mentors, lightning talk coaches, or just allies on the side as they travel along their journeys. Um, it's been a hard year for you too. I hear the word tired a lot from my colleagues as well. And yet you found the time and energy made the space to support our students. You made a difference in the lives of our students and you helped them chart a new path forward. We cannot overstate how important your work is. We asked our students to write a few words of appreciation when they submitted their projects for the poster sessions. And a full listing of those are available on the Google site. I wanna share just a few and I will tell you that it was really hard to just pick a few. Um, but I'm gonna read about five of them because I couldn't get it down to less to give you a sense of what a difference a research mentor makes. Dr. Alshanowski saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. She introduced me to research and provided me with the support I needed to thrive in my undergraduate career. I'll be forever grateful to have had her as my advisor. For completing this wonderful journey, I'd like to sincerely thank Professor Jonathan Reek for always supporting me to follow my beliefs. I do appreciate him a lot for the experiences, instruction, and most of all, his patience to listen and allow me to dig deeper into my interest field. Dr. Trevor Coughlin has provided me with incredible mentorship throughout my final year at Boise State. He helped foster my innate curiosity about the natural world and facilitate my development into a more confident ecological researcher. 
I had such a fantastic experience working with Dr. Babbitt. I really appreciated the consistent feedback I got from her that allowed me to grow during this process that was very new to me. And Lisa Beamer has been the best mentor I have ever had because she pushed me to be the best teacher researcher I can be. And she believed in me and my work. She stood by me every step of the way. I never felt alone and she was always willing to help when I needed it. So everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, some tips to get the most out of today. I'm gonna ask you to try virtual conferences and showcases are really hard. There are so many distractions. Can't tell you to turn off your computer because then you wouldn't be here. But really try to attend the showcase and turn off any other devices that you don't need. Close out of other windows, concentrate on the session you're attending. Fully participate. Ask questions of the speakers. Utilize the chat box. We'll be collecting those and monitoring them and getting the questions to the speakers. Take notes. Engage fully. In this lightning talk session, we advise you to use the speaker view. That way you can focus in only on the person who's speaking and not the rest of these little boxes and on their slide. After this session will be a research conversation session. And if possible, those will be in small rooms. Unmute and turn your camera on if, if you're in a place that you can, so you can really engage in the conversation. And this afternoon in the poster sessions, remember you need to be registered on four waves to attend that. You um, and you should have information about that and we'll help you through it. You can use the contact presenter button to send an email to the submitting student. You can post a comment or question right there on the site. And you can engage in the live poster session where you get to go in and have a video conversation in small groups with each poster presenter. All, as I mentioned earlier, all registered undergrads are automatically entered in a drawing for prizes. You need to complete the form to get the bigger prizes, but just by being registered, you are also um, entered for a coffee card. Okay, I am gonna now turn it over to Michal and stop sharing so that she can share. All right, everybody, um, can you see my screen okay? Wonderful, let me just move a few things out of the way. And uh, we're gonna get started this morning with our plenary event for the showcase, the Student Lightning Talks. Um, these Student Lightning Talks are, um, you know, our, our plenary event because we've asked every faculty member to nominate up to one student for this honor. Um, these are advanced students in their research um, most of them are juniors and seniors, and um, we we wanted to showcase um, you know some of the you know really highlight some of the um, the amazing research that's going here, and to make sure that everybody gets a chance to see it. So every faculty member was able to nominate up to one uh, speaker, and we uh, selected as a committee fifteen of those speakers. We're really excited to have you join us and to have you hear them um, this morning. You can, um, of course, also engage through social media by using the hashtag um, URS2022. And we hope to see lots of uh, engagement on social media with this. And finally, let's get started. So our first speaker today is Jesse Boyer from Interdisciplinary Professional Studies. And Jesse's presentation is titled Generating Insights into Barriers to Enrollment with User Experience Research. Jesse, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Michal. Uh, so I am a 38 year old single mom who decided to come back to school and finish my degree in 2020. This is my third attempt at college. So as you're listening, you can imagine how personal the stakes are for me, having experienced the risk and the sacrifice of returning to college as an adult. Like many facing this decision, I had to weigh continuing to build on my established but limited political career against the investment of time and money for a chance to access greater opportunities and make life better for me and my young daughter. This research was done as the capstone for my user experience research or UX certificate conducted in partnership with the Interdisciplinary Professional Studies Program, formerly known as uh, Multidisciplinary Studies. UX applies the tools of an anthropologist to discover insightful and imaginative ways to improve on products, uh, pr services, and processes. My goal in this research was to discover if I could use UX 
to make a meaningful contribution to increasing access to higher education. I leverage tools like field observations at IPS faculty meetings, interviewing current and prospective students and user journey mapping, or in this case, student journey mapping uh, to gather data and identify themes. My findings revealed the kinds of extrinsic barriers that you might already have imagined, like managing the cost of tuition with a loss of income, finding childcare and gaining buy-in from stakeholders such as spouses. But you might be surprised to hear that intrinsic barriers were at least as important um, in decision-making as the extrinsic ones, and sometimes even more so. For example, a high proportion of respondents reported feeling hesitant to return based on feelings of shame about not already having their degree and insecurity about being the oldest person in their class, both connected to a need for belonging. So now that we understand some of the obstacles from the student or prospective student's point of view, how can these insights be used to help increase the number of adults who make it to graduation day? My recommendations to department leadership were aimed at informing two complementary marketing strategies. The first and easier recommendation is to clearly communicate the value of what is being offered. This includes not only the return on investment, but also the uncommonly student-centered culture at IPS with the reassurance that their complex and varied life circumstances will be met with empathy. IPS course design already prioritizes important skills like building confidence to combat imposter syndrome and empowering students to take charge of their academic and professional trajectories. So it's simply a matter of accurately delivering that message. Secondly, marketing materials need to address pain points by reducing confusion and mitigating shame. This is the more difficult condition to fulfill, but understanding the user experience is the first step. Perhaps it's as simple as having more age diversity in photo content. After all, among the well-documented benefits of representation is the feeling of belonging. The bottom line of this research is that if my recommendations directly or indirectly lead to one single person earning their degree who wouldn't have otherwise, then it was a massive success. Uh, I wanna thank Dr. Kendall House for developing an excellent UX curriculum and Alexis Kenyon for facilitating this research. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jesse. Up next, we have Floriana Chalia from Computer Science talking to us today about multiplex networks with grounded and embodied layers for child language acquisition. Floriana. Thank you. Do you remember how you learned your first language? Chances are that you don't because learning a language is something so innate to humans that people don't think about it much. Everyone learns at least one language and uses it every day to communicate with the rest of the world. Study shows that the environment in which babies learn their first language is highly perceptual, meaning that they make connections between the words that they already know and the ones that they're learning on different levels. For example, in the blue box, there is a visual level, meaning that a child <coughs> learns the word zebra because they are already familiar with another animal whose name they know, like horse, for example. Or on a phonological level in the, in the green box, we know that a child can learn the word a knee for, because it sounds similar to another word that they already know, like the word to see. So we can say that interacting with the world is what really simulates children lear language learning. However, we know that this is also true with the second language learning. In fact, this is what really stimulated my interest for this project because of my personal experience while learning English. I would often connect words on a phonological level to remember them. Now, have you ever wondered how computers learn languages? How is it that we can talk to Siri or Alexa? Computers don't have the same ability to, in, to interact with the world the same way that humans do, yet we're still able to communicate with them using human languages like English to ask them to perform tasks. Computers learn languages by having millions and millions of text samples shown to them. However, didn't we say that language learning environment is perceptual? Language learning doesn't involve text the same way people don't learn a language by just hearing random words. My research project aims to resolve this lack of multimodality when teaching a language to a computer. I have developed a way to incorporate a visual and a sensory motor level of word connection by using established machine learning techniques to connect visual features and sensory motor feature features using a, a sensory motor um, a data set um, together with the textual and phonological layers um, and other important aspects of the world that words connect to. 
My experiments show that our model learns words roughly in the same order that children do, and that having a visual representation significantly aids language learning in children of two and three years of age. Though more research is needed, this work brings us a step closer to bridging the gap between how humans learn languages and how machines are taught to represent and use language in hope to one day eliminate the barriers that we've all experienced while talking to our devices. Thank you. Thank you, Floriana. Up next, we have Brie Ellison from Interdisciplinary Studies with a talk titled, Challenges and Opportunities in Human Subjects Research, Assessing Glyphosate um, ex Exposure in Pregnant Women. Brie, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Many of you are probably familiar with weed killers like Roundup, a common herbicide that my own parents used on their farm. Glyphosate is the main ingredient in products like Roundup, and its usage rose 1,200% worldwide in the last two decades. It's great at destroying weeds, but what's it doing to our health? A few previous studies have suggested that glyphosate exposure during pregnancy may lead to preterm birth, but much more research is needed to understand if this is true and how exposure is occurring. We designed a robust study to follow 40 women throughout pregnancy, collecting weekly and sometimes daily urine samples during a two-week dietary intervention to compare glyphosate levels when eating organically versus conventionally. We are currently awaiting results from the CDC regarding the glyphosate measurements. In the meantime, I'd like to share our discoveries about human subjects research and how we were successful despite many challenges. One of the challenges was the COVID-19 pandemic. Recruitment and informed consent is a vital step in human subjects research, and it's typically done in person. Instead, we created YouTube videos to better connect with the participants. We would park outside their house, drop the forms on the doorstep, send them links to the videos, and phone them to go over the paperwork. Then we would drop off the urine cup and pick it up when it was filled, all in real time. That allowed us to maintain social distancing, but keep a more personal feel which ended up being a key part of our success in participant retention. And participant retention was a major concern throughout our study. We had to keep the women engaged on a weekly and sometimes daily basis to get the kind of in-depth data that's missing from this area of research. On top of that, many of the women were dealing with difficulties that impacted their availability. One of our participants, uh, was homeless for the duration of the study. I once had to pick up a sample outside a Hobby Lobby. Many of them dealt with food and housing insecurity, irregular job schedules, and children with disabilities. But despite these challenges, we collected 1,395 samples from 40 women over a nine month period for a 97% compliance rate. How did we do it? By building a personal connection with these women. In research, it's easy to say that we give back to our participants retroactively through results. But through our study, we were able to immediately impact these women and help improve the quality of life. We built personal connections. We texted them updates and reminders, compensated them with gift cards, and provided each with $360 in groceries. We knew them by name, knew what they were dealing with, and worked with their unique situations as much as possible. Throughout the study, we had many women express their gratitude for the help we provided them, as well as excitement for our research. If you'd like to hear more about this important stepping stone in glyphosate research, please feel free to check out my poster and ask me any questions. Thank you so much, Bri. Up next, we have Marissa Maldonado from Mathematics with a talk titled, The Healing Turtle and Career. Take it away, Marissa. I was put on the doorstep of spirituality. As a young Native American girl, beginning to grasp the idea of gratitude and purpose. During a spiritual ceremony known as Sundance on the Wind River Reservation, I was given my native name at approximately seven years old. It is pronounced Ba Na Bay, which translates to healing turtle, hence the reference to the teepee in my slide. 
I naively thought it would mean I become a doctor or a nurse, but it was much more than that. I was put on this earth to help others, to guide them on their path, and furthermore, to take care of myself in order to do that. It made sense for me to go into STEM education. During my time as a mathematics and computer science major, I started to recognize that my peers within STEM were showing spite for their degree once they earned it. They felt they hadn't taken much back with them. Along that time span, I discovered the word career, C-U-R-R-E-R-E, -E, which is the study between subject and self. This solidified my philosophy of education because I felt I was able to crack the code on how to add more substance and foundation to what I was learning. And eventually I realized that I wanted to evolve the student experience such that other students would not feel they lost years studying their major. A cost of this is a lower connection between students and their perseverance of knowledge if we do not acknowledge career. Further referencing to my slide, the globe on the left represents my passion for mathematics and seeing structure in the world. Career enabled me to believe in the connection between logic and spirituality. This is ironic because I am a mathematics major. Perhaps it sounds impossible to connect subjective feelings to mathematics, but I felt empowered to exist as healing turtle within that realm. Logic lives in all problems, but if the proof is never pursued, there never exists a better outcome. As I plant seeds of self-discovery for those who cross my path, they can then share their growth with others and the cycle continues. This is the healing turtle. This pursuit is possible for any creative mathematician, musician, and all of the silver linings between the arts and sciences. And how do we create this? Allow course curriculums to push students in documenting their personal journey as self and student to understand how that impacts their education, just as I did through publishing this article. In my slide, this is represented as the cyclical process of structure and heritage coexisting between one another. It is a privilege to become a self-directed learner. We have given students the, tool, the tools to study arithmetic, to analyze prose, to become fluent in worldly matters, but now we must develop the tools to study self. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa. Up next, we have Valerie Marie from Biological uh, Science with Drone Imagery Enables Fine Scale Detection of Sagebrush Dieback During a Summer Heat Wave. Valerie, take it away. Thank you. So sagebrush species are an essential part of the Western desert ecosystem. It has many influences on local recreation and employment. These shrubs help to prevent erosion, capture water, sustain wild animal populations, and more. Climate change imposes a large threat to these populations as we see a climbing number of wildfires, less precipitation, and more high heat summer days. This project focuses on the latter issue by comparing imagery taken at Castle Rock State Park over the summer of 2021 when an unprecedented, unprecedented heat wave went over that area. We used drones to gather imagery overhead in June and September. Then I used software to stitch these images together into one large image with high resolution. You could see that on my slide in the top two photos. By outlining individual shrubs, I was able to extract the green band of the color images and collect the green leaf index inside that perimeter. You can see that in my bottom two photos. Greenness directly corresponds to photosynthetic activity and the well being of a plant. The green leaf index gives me a number for how much green there is between zero and one. After comparing the two time steps, I found that 72% of the shrubs had lost green and 28% had gained green. Of the shrubs that lost their greenness, there was an average loss of 10.8%, and of the shrubs that gained their greenness, there was an average gain of 5%. This location is one site out of four along an elevation gradient with several different shrub species. The next step is to run this same green leaf index on all four of the Castle Rock sites from June and September. This will give us a wider range of data analyses over that same 2021 heat wave. These methods allow us to identify resilient shrubs that have retained their greenness during this heat wave, and we can target those shrubs to collect seeds for restoration pursuits. The advantage of drone data is to have a map that spans hundreds or thousands of individual shrubs which is more data than we could collect on the ground. This research brings vital information to the conversation of where and how to allocate tight budget funds on con conservation of the sagebrush step that so many of us depend on. It also shows that one hot and dry summer can have on this slow growing plant. 
If you have any questions for me, my project number is 95 in group B. Thank you. Thanks so much, Valerie. Up next, we have Cooper McGrath from Biological Sciences with Abracadabra. Cytokines make DNA repair disappear in breast cancer. Take it away, Cooper. Thank you. Today, I want to talk to you about the proteins known as BRCA1 and BRCA2, hence my title, Abracadabra, all in the sense of breast cancer. When the BRCA proteins seen in blue are removed from a breast cancer cell, the breast cancer cell becomes even more aggressive, seen as the brownish blob becoming an angry face cell. These aggressive breast cancer cells are more likely to metastasize or spread to other parts of your body, such as your lungs, your liver, and your brain. And I think we can agree those are all kind of important. This is the work of cytokines, seen as the bright pink blob. We care about breast cancer because one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. That's over 280,000 new cases each year in the United States alone. Unfortunately, women with metastatic breast cancer have only a 27% chance of surviving for five years or longer. Imagine a world where we could use magic to solve that. We could wave our wands and say the magic word, abracadabra, and all the cancer would disappear. Breast cancer can be summoned from many different sources, such as the accumulation of mutations in the cell's DNA. It is these mutations in the DNA that cause the cancer to become more aggressive. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are proteins that use powerful spells to protect against these mutations. These spells are actually a process known as DNA repair. Now, when these proteins don't work properly, the cancer has more mutations and is more aggressive. Cytokines are proteins secreted by the immune system to signal the body to do many different things, such as causing inflammation. Prolonged inflammation in a cancer tissue is associated with a poor outcome for patients. This is done by making certain proteins disappear and others appear out of thin air. A pro-inflammatory cytokine is a cytokine that causes inflammation. Our lab hypothesizes that certain pro-inflammatory cytokines activate a signal within the cell that leads to the disappearance of the BRCA proteins. And like we said in our previous example, if our BRCA proteins cannot cast their spells, this will lead to a decrease in DNA repair, a more aggressive cancer, and a higher likelihood that the cancer will spread to other parts of our body. My research is important because it suggests that if we develop therapeutics to block these pro-inflammatory cytokines, it will in turn lead to a less aggressive cancer less metastases, and a better survival for patients. Thank you for listening. And of course, if you have any questions, come see me in my poster later today. And remember, have a magical day. Thanks for that, Cooper. Up next, we have Dustin Wen from Material Science and Engineering. And the talk is titled, Alternative Materials for Battery Electrodes. Dustin? Hello everyone, my name is Dustin Nguyen and my presentation is on alternative materials for battery electrodes. I want to tell you a story of what led me to pursue research. I'm an army veteran and midway through my deployment in Afghanistan back in 2012, I decided I wanted to leave the army and go back to school. Now, I didn't know what to study. So in order to calm myself from the stress of the deployment and figure out my future, I decided to binge watch Star Wars. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. While watching all the lightsaber fights, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool to have a lightsaber? That's when it hit me. I wanted to create a real life lightsaber. During the same time, I was reading a book called Physics of the Impossible, where it has a chapter on lightsabers. Around the end of the chapter, it covers the energy requirements for a lightsaber. It said it required the energy equivalent of a nuclear reactor inside a AA battery. Now, can you imagine a battery that powerful in your car? A car with that type of battery could travel around the US multiple times on a single charge. This is what inspired me to pursue battery research. To make this type of battery possible, we need new materials that can significantly increase the amount of energy that can be stored inside a battery cell. This is what we call energy density. Currently, the most popular battery on the market is lithium ion batteries. Their popularity is due to their high energy density and cyclability, which is the number of times you can uh, charge and discharge. The problem uh, that they currently face is that it takes them a long time to fully charge 
and its lifespan will decrease over time. An electric car, depending on the make and model, can take several hours to fully charge. This is not ideal for long distance driving. Additionally, if lithium ion batteries are charged too fast, it can decrease its lifespan and increase the potential buildup of dendrites. Dendrites are columns of spent lithium forming on wooden electrodes in a battery. The buildup of these dendrites can cause a battery to short circuit and cause a thermal runaway. To give you an idea what thermal, way, thermal, uh, thermal runaway will look like in a battery, the Samsung phones uh, a couple of years back that spontaneously caught, uh, caught on fire is a perfect example of this. Current lithium ion batteries use graphite as one of the electrodes. The material I'm currently researching to replace graphite is annotase titanium dioxide nanoparticles. What makes it appealing is that it has a high energy density, better long-term cycling, and is safer to use. I'm currently researching how water impacts the electrochemical performance of my material as the synthesis is water-driven. My dream of developing a functional lightsaber may be unrealistic or fanciful, but to me, it's what drives me to research how to make the next super battery that can help power the world. Thank you for listening. And my poster number is 126 in group B. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dustin. I hope you do get to make that lightsaber. <laughs> um, this would be a great time to remind everybody that you can put questions in the chat um, and we'll uh, draw from those questions in the Q&A session right after this. And we're very excited to see so many of you here. All right, up next, we have Audrey Parker from Material Science and Engineering with a talk titled, Nanoscale Magnetic Mapping, Mapping Magnetic Fields to Enable Future Technologies. Audrey, take it away. Magnetic forces govern every aspect of life as we know it. The Earth's magnetic North Pole has been fundamental for human navigation. The healthcare industry has utilized magnetic fields to distinguish human diseases in magnetic resonance imaging, otherwise known as MRIs. In fact, each of us is currently using magnetic forces to operate our cell phones and computers. Magnetic forces have yielded unique technology capable of a wealth of opportunities. And by better understanding them, we can continue to advance modern technology in remarkable ways. In fact, these magnetic forces, which facilitate the formation of galaxies, also exist on a much, much smaller scale. These magnetic nanorays seen here are only 200 nanometers long. To clarify, that's 500 times smaller than the width of a human hair. Despite their amazingly small size, they have enabled tremendous advancements in technology over the last decade. Recent studies have identified magnetic nanorays as functioning devices for logic computation, encryption, and data storage. They will serve as a next generation of electronic devices called nanomagnetics, which have the unique capability in maximizing data storage while operating under low cost and low power environments. While the functionality of these devices has been very promising, a key issue seen with these nanomagnets has been understanding the magnetic properties of the individual interacting elements via high resolution imaging. This lattice of nanomagnets, or ego waffle-like grids seen on the right, is completely invisible to the naked eye. And even the most powerful forms of optical microscopy are not capable of distinguishing its features. Instead, an advanced imaging method called atomic force microscopy, otherwise known as AFM, has been used to meet the demand for high resolution images. During AFM, a probe whose tip is only a few atoms wide is brought down to the material surface and can image the sample topography on an atomic scale. Now, when we magnetize this probe, there are unique interactions between the tip and sample surface, which reveal the material's magnetic properties. I think we can all think back to times we've played with magnets. Opposites attract and likes repel. The imaging done here is no different. Brighter areas seen on the magnetic is are areas where the tip and sample are attracted meaning they have opposite magnetic forces. Darker areas show regions where the tip and sample repel, meaning they exhibit the same magnetic force. These high resolution images have the capability to streamline nanomagnetic research by precisely indicating where the magnetic fields on the sample are located and how they may change in the presence of an external magnetic field. These techniques serve as an essential next step for better understanding magnetic devices 
and progressing their implementation into extraordinary technological advances. Thank you. Thanks so much, Audrey. Up next, we have Margaret Quattrero from Nursing with a, uh, with a, <laughs> a talk titled, Using <laughs> Simulation and Communication to Challenge Weight and Bias in Healthcare. Take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> Carly hates going to the doctor. She hates getting on the scale. She hates the crinkle of the table paper under the weight of her bottom. She hates that the blood pressure cuff is always too small. Imagine how frustrating that would be. Carly once told me that she was recommended bariatric surgery when what she really needed was to have an ovarian cyst removed. Carly does not know her BMI, but she knows that whenever a provider brings it up, a long talk on diet and exercise will ensue. Carly knows that her doctor treats her differently because she is fat. Unfortunately, the research validates Carly's experiences of stigma and healthcare providers do have significant weight bias. This weight bias has a negative effect on the health outcomes for people with obesity. This population delays seeking healthcare. They continually switch providers and they have an overall mistrust of the medical community. Can you blame them? This all equates to poor health outcomes. The CDC estimates that about 40% of adults in the U.S. are considered obese. If 40% of adults in the U.S. are experiencing weight bias from their healthcare providers, I would say that the medical community is failing. In order to challenge medical weight bias, here at Boise State, we first examined explicit biases in first semester nursing students. Our survey included a pre and post test using the beliefs about obese person scale, the fat phobia scale, and qualitative questions. Students in our intervention group were taught the LEARN model of communication. This acronym stands for listen, explain, acknowledge, recommend, and negotiate. It focuses primarily on listening. LEARN was woven into first semester coursework and near the end of the first semester, the students had a simulation with Carly, a high fidelity mannequin. Uh, their job was to assess the patient and report their findings and recommendations for treatment. The simulation was informed by my original interview with Carly, whose name was changed, um, the real life person. Afterwards, students took the same questionnaires. The change in pre and post testing was significant. Students had more weight neutral beliefs after meeting Carly. Qualitative shifts showed that students realized that treating everyone the same was not applicable in the simulation. In fact, students realized that they needed to apply patient-centered care. This care includes making accommodations for different size bodies, like getting the correct blood pressure cuff size and also ditching the diet and exercise education recommendation model. Overall, the study made an immediate impact on how students interacted with Carly. We hope to reevaluate the longevity of these impacts when these same students are in their senior semester. My own hope is that this research inspires you to challenge and change your existing weight biases. Many resources are available. Much gratitude to Amy Pence Brown for her inspiring work. The interviewee Carly my research partners and faculty, please check out our poster. It is number 88 in group A. Thanks, Margaret. Up next, we have Colin Saffel from Anthropology with a talk titled, Cattle to Slaughter, the Impact of Consumption. Colin. Uh, just waiting for the other ones. There we go. When looking at this image, what do you see? I see an animal that is valued less than your cat or dog at home. Why are these two creatures so different? One is raised and killed as part of the meat industry, while the other enjoys a peaceful life. Not only are the former killed, but their life is horrible, being kept in inhumane conditions and treated as a factor of profit more than a living, breathing creature. Not only do the industrial farms that raise these animals neglect them, but they are also a leading cause of environmental impacts and carbon emissions plaguing our planet today. 
The large scale production and personal consumption of meat is a factor that is often overlooked and ignored by the average consumer when purchasing their dinner. Using cattle as a basis, as 82% of global production is through beef, we can look further into the ignored side of the industry. The production of one kilogram for, of beef, for example, creates as much environmental impact as driving 160 miles in an American mid-sized car. Deforestation, another cause for concern among climate change models, is promoted through growing consumer demands for meat. Forest and land is cleared to allow for more production, not only of animals, but also the crops used as feed. Global trends show that by 2030, consumption of meat will have increased by as much as 72% of current levels. With these impacts on our planet known, how can methods change to give these animals a full life while still allowing us to eat meat without current immoral processes? Switching the methods of production and educating consumers is the answer. Pastoral or open grazing farms allows us to produce less but overall healthier cattle. Grass-fed beef is a prized item among consumers, being seen as a more natural, better alternative than average cuts found in big box retailers like grocery stores. Animals raised on these types of farms live full lives enjoying their time on the planet instead of being neglecting and cruelly treated as product. They are better for both animal and human. Consumers too have a role to play in improving these trends. Embracing more awful products like livers and intestines would allow for similar levels of consumption while lowering environmental impact of produced waste by around 10%. Through these methods, animals are still killed, but it opens consumption of meat as an amoral, not immoral practice. There is also an ecological benefit to the lands pastoral animals feed on, as they are found to be more diverse, healthier, and they also have the benefit of acting as a carbon sink, absorbing methane created from herds, lowering overall emissions from the meat industry. There is no reason why one type of creature should be treated as poorly as industrial herds are. If we want to lessen climate change and our own guilt over the per treatment of animals, then we must switch to a better model of production. Lands currently being used can be reformed into holistic farms, and crop areas that produce feed have the potential to grow healthy lands for more natural product. People do not have to stop eating meat to lessen climate change. They need to treat the lives of those they take with respect and acknowledge their use as food, giving animals the best life possible before being consumed. These ch this changes meat eating and the raising of these animals from an immoral practice to an amoral one. Thank you. Also, please make sure to check out my poster. I go a little bit more in depth into the research about uh, not only the environmental impacts, but also cultural trends on meat eating around the world. So thank you. Thank you for that perspective on this um, topic, Colin. All right, up next, we have Sierra Sanderson from Mechanical Engineering speaking to us today about alleviating the effects of imposter phenomenon amongst engineering students. Sierra, take it away. Thank you so much. Can you see me? I can't see myself. Not yet. You cannot see me? Oh, we can, we can see you. Yeah, we can see you. Okay, okay. <laughs> when I walk into an engineering classroom full of boys, it's intimidating. I assume they grew up working on cars with their dad or have been programming in their free time since they were 10. At the height of feeling like I didn't belong in engineering, I learned about imposter phenomenon, a term coined by Dr. Pauline Rose Clance. According to her definition, imposter phenomenon, better known in pop culture as imposter syndrome, is a psychological experience of intellectual and professional fraudulence. So-called imposters often feel like they've gotten to where they are due to luck rather than their own abilities. Learning that there was a name for this made me wonder if my own feelings of self-doubt weren't necessarily telling me the truth about myself and that maybe I wasn't alone in feeling them. For my research, I co-produced a 13-minute mini-documentary in which I interviewed my engineering peers and faculty about their experiences dealing with and overcoming self-doubt and imposter feelings. I interviewed Dr. Lighty, our dean, who's a white woman, and two PhD students, both Black women. And even though I look up to these three so much and they are clearly brilliant and successful and, in my opinion, have no reason to feel any self-doubt, I was not surprised to hear that they had also felt uncomfortable in rooms where they were outnumbered and had stories that I could relate to. However, the last interview strangely had the greatest impact on me. It was with a white male undergrad student. He had been in almost all of my classes. In my head, he belonged more than anyone. 
hearing the imposter thoughts that had haunted him while sitting in classrooms that we had shared was unexpected and enlightening. So when it came to my actual research, I had the experimental group watch the mini documentary before answering a survey that would measure their level of imposter phenomenon, while the control group would just directly be given the survey without being exposed to the intervention. My hypothesis, of course, was that once the engineering students realized that a lot of people shared their feelings of self-doubt, they would report lower rates of imposter phenomenon. When the data came back, we actually found the opposite. Undergraduate students who watched the mini documentary scored higher on the imposter phenomenon scale than those in the control group. I was so confused. Producing the documentary had been almost therapeutic for me. It had helped me separate facts from feelings and shown me that I wasn't alone. And now the data was showing that it had the opposite effect on other students. I regret not collecting more qualitative data to figure out why or if that's even what was actually happening. Did watching the documentary make students feel worse about themselves or did it make them more aware of their feelings of imposter phenomenon and open to sharing them? With the data I have, I honestly can't say for sure. I have a lot of unanswered questions still, but my instinct is that further research would show that being open and vulnerable and willing to discuss our insecurities might make us uncomfortable, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, this discomfort is exactly what I believe leads to growth, healing, and an understanding that we are not alone. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sierra. Up next, we have Kenzie Stallings from Music with a talk titled, Musical Storytelling in the National Parks. Kenzie? Hi everyone, my name is Kenzie Stallings. Over 297 million people from around the world visited national park lands in 2021. Who here is part of this number? I know I definitely am. Many people visit these lands to experience adventure, curiosity, discovery, and inspiration. As a park ranger, it is my job to help provide and enhance these experiences through ranger programs. For my research project, I wanted to combine my passion and love for music and giving astronomy programs and create a ranger program that uses both. I researched why the night sky interests people, how musicology can enhance visitor experiences, excuse me, and how to combine these subjects into a ranger program. I collected topics of interest from visitors who attended previous presentations of my astronomy programs at Grand Canyon National Park. I also analyzed secondary source materials on the use of ecomusicology in concert, museum, and cultural contexts. And finally, I performed a social media survey analysis on the question, why do you look up at the night sky? With this research, I designed a ranger program about the seasonal night sky told through stories and music. My ranger program will consist of me sharing the folklore of the stars, talking about how we can travel back in time by looking into space, and sharing how the sight of stars can make us dream. I will also be playing the music of Jenny Brandon titled Starry Night for B-flat clarinet, which consists of three movements titled The Starlight Night, Bright Star, and The Sight of Stars. Each of these movements directly relates to the topics in my program, and I will play this music to help visitors create personal connections to these themes about the night sky. The picture that you see on the screen is what it'll look like for me to be presenting this program as the lead astro ranger at Craters the Moon National Monument this summer in Idaho. This ranger program will help provide experiences of the curiosity and discovery of folklore and the science of the night sky, as well as inspire visitors to learn more intently to the universe they can live in and as they visit at Craters of the Moon. If you'd like to learn more about visiting Craters of the Moon National Monument or even are interested in coming to see my program, you can visit their website at nps.gov forward slash CRMO. You're also more than welcome to come uh, listen to me talk more about my poster presentation. My poster number is 119 in group B. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenzie. Maybe you can put that link in the chat so folks can visit it. 
Up next, we have Taylor Tatum from Geoscience with a talk titled Sound Dependence on Discharge and Wave Configuration at Boise Whitewater Park. Tatum. All right, hi everyone. So when you first think of sound, what is the first thing you think of? Now, what if I told you, or um, you've been spoiled by the post, uh, the picture in front of you, what if I told you that sound could be used to measure water? Infrasound is a sound that occurs at a frequency below human hearing that is becoming more commonly used within the earth sciences. It can be used for earthquakes, volcanoes, even avalanches. But in this study, I use it to measure the relationship between sound and stream characteristics at a place some of you may be familiar with, Boise Whitewater Park. Using recorded data from 2016 and 2021, I use sound to look for changes in discharge, which is the amount of water passing through at a given time, and wave configuration, which is the type of wave created by Whitewater Park that day for recreational purposes. There's two different types of waves, green waves, which are used by surfers, and wave hole waves, which are used by kayakers. And I'll direct you back to this picture. And the funny thing that I'd actually like to point out uh, about this specific wave on the picture is that's actually a surfer on a wave hole wave, which as we mentioned now, is actually a kayak wave. Now, I'm not either a surfer or a kayaker, so I can't really tell you completely why or how, but I can explain why using sound to explain these waves is important. Sound is still a very new application, but there exists a potential that sound can be used as an alternative monitoring device to current measuring infrastructure. Of course, with the investigation of more of these relationships that could possibly exist. Current stream infrastructure made up of devices found in the river is used to measure annual flow rates, discharge, monitor flooding events, and look for specific hazard waves. And sound could be important because one, it's more cost effective and it's non-invasive since you're putting things on the shore rather than within the river. And it's less likely to get washed away by flooding as a result. So what did this project in particular find? We found that patterns and relationships between sound and stream characteristics aren't visible below a certain flow. It's easier to see large changes within the system rather than smaller changes, and that kayak waves are quieter than surf waves. Using the results as well as future work, we can not only further examine these relationships, but also other relationships within the stream system. So if you're interested in learning more about the relationship between sound and water, I encourage you to visit my poster later today. I'm project number 58 in group B. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Taylor. Up next, we have Claire Vaga okay. with environmental from the Department um, of Environmental so the Studies. Thing that I oh. noticed was okay. Sorry about that. Up um, next, we have Claire Vaga with from Environmental Studies with a talk titled "Mapping the Oases of the High Desert." Claire, take it away. Thank you. If you've gone for a hike or even glanced up at the Boise foothills, it's likely you noticed its dry and arid nature. An immense number of the parts and pieces that compose these high desert landscapes are dependent upon these slivers of green that reside amongst the brown. Riparian habitats or land that, is surra that surrounds and is influenced by a body of water greatly impact the functions of arid ecosystems and are highlighted in this bird's eye view imagery. Presently, there is not a practical or set method that captures the naturally varied extent of riparian zones. In order to improve land management practices and implement necessary conservation strategies, we can capitalize on the increasing availability of LIDAR, which is a remote sensing method that shoots laser pulses from an airborne system to measure the variable distances to Earth. My research is focused on determining a way to accurately predict the extent of these vital vegetative communities. The Dry Creek Experimental Watershed, located off Bogus Basin Road within the Boise foothills served as my study site. To begin, I used LIDAR data collected from a helicopter and special analysis tools within mapping software to determine the flow of water across the landscape. From there, I generated a random sample of points along the stream network. I relied on satellite imagery to mark the extent of vegetation when present or marked a singular point when not present. After compiling the points and additional influential variables like elevation, I transferred the data to a coding software. Within the software, I built a model that compiles important predictive variables and allows for an accurate picture of the riparian vegetation to be created. The key purpose of developing the methods and model is to close the gap that exists between land managers and the landscape itself. 
My research will ultimately provide further understanding of the presence of riparian habitats within high desert ecosystems, as well as a series of tools that will allow the implementation of improved land management practices. Riparian habitats mimic the look and function of veins and that they carry vital nutrients throughout the landscape. These zones also protect and provide for plants and animals, maintain the soil and water systems, and mitigate the effects of climate change. Not only do these oases of the desert serve an abundance of pra practical purposes, but they are a critical means to life in the sagebrush sea. I welcome you to visit my virtual booth in the Group B poster session. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ms. Bogut. Up next, we have our very last presentation this morning with Riley Wiesler from Global Studies with a talk titled Hong Kong's Democratic Movement, a Country in Turmoil. Riley, take it away. Thank you. My first exposure to Hong Kong's democratic movement was through a high school friend. She would tell me about her childhood growing up in Hong Kong and often emphasized that her and her family both were and were not Chinese. Back then, the nuances between ethnicity and nationality flew completely over my head. So the topic was pushed to the back of my mind. I never asked about it and it was forgotten. My second exposure to the conflict was a news article, more specifically an image of the Hong Kong police throwing tear gas canisters into a crowd of protesters. Unlike in high school, this image of Hong Kong stuck with me, resulting in a rabbit hole that has led me to where I am today, presenting to all of you. Discontent in Hong Kong has been rising over the years and in 2019, violence levels within the territory peaked. This in mind, the purpose of my research was to answer the question of why this was happening and as an extension, what the US specifically could do about it. My research approach was a qualitative crisis analysis. Essentially, I read a lot and from there synthesized together everything I had learned into a final paper that discussed the local, national, regional, and global dimensions of the conflict surrounding Hong Kong's pro-democratic movement. And although COVID has drastically slowed the protest momentum, their desire for democracy has not disappeared, making the likelihood for future confrontation high and conflict resolution paramount for ensuring regional stability. But what is the big picture message of my research? First and foremost, conflict is complex. Like a pile of tangled rope, if we only focus on undoing a single knot, we may fail to realize that we are creating more. In the same sense, conflict in our globalized world does not call for a single perfect solution, but synthesizing solutions that target several drivers of conflict. Secondly, it urges us to consider our relative position of power within the international community and the validity of foreign intervention in conflicts like Hong Kong that are asymmetrical in nature. Hong Kong is very small. And the findings of my research show that the former colony is intrinsically tied to mainland China on several dimensions, politically, economically, and environmentally. The implications of this are that one, a clean break from the mainland is not as easy as achieving universal suffrage or being recognized by the UN as a sovereign nation. And two, foreign intervention is absolutely necessary if the protesters want to achieve any sort of favorable outcome in this conflict. They themselves seem to be very aware of this reality, exemplified by the airport sit-ins that characterized much of 2019. Notably, American flags were not an unusual sight at these events. Hong Kong is trying to get our attention. As an international superpower, it's important that we listen. And although none of us are calling the shots on US foreign policy, public awareness is a crucial step in shifting any political climate. We don't have to be experts by any means, but being informed is a good first step and it can be as easy as asking what it means to both be and not be Chinese. If you'd like to know more, please stop by my poster. I'm number 59 in group B. Thank you. Thank you so much, Riley. And thank you everybody for your wonderful presentations. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Can we get a round of applause for our speakers? We can um, applaud since we're in a visual medium using sign language applause, which is this, or you can use your reaction uh, button on your screen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. That was awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm.